NASA just canceled what was going to be its first lunar rover in over 50 years. We also learned more details about SpaceX's proposal to deorbit the International Space Station, and the company's Falcon 9 rocket may be quickly returning to flight in the coming days. As always, we'll be covering that and a whole lot more this week in Spaceflight. NASA's Europa Clipper, the agency's multi-billion dollar flagship mission to Jupiter's moon Europa, has hit a troubling engineering snag, putting it in danger of a massive delay. Now, you've probably heard about Europa Clipper before. It's NASA's mission to study Jupiter's icy moon Europa. It's supposed to launch later this year on a SpaceX Falcon Heavy, after which it'll perform a flyby of Earth and Mars before arriving at Jupiter. There, it'll perform several flybys of Europa, gathering data about the moon with each pass. However, the radiation environment around Jupiter is quite harsh. The planet's strong magnetic field traps charged particles from the solar wind and makes the radiation too strong around the giant planet. This means that whenever we send a spacecraft to Jupiter and it gets anywhere close to it and its radiation belts, the spacecraft needs to be hardened against that radiation. And that is actually what's putting this mission in trouble. Just a few months ago, NASA got notice that the same type of transistors used on Europa Clipper's power systems weren't passing radiation tests when being tested for other projects. These essentially would fail at far lower radiation levels than those found around Jupiter, something that puts the reliability of Europa Clipper's own transistors into question. NASA is currently working with the manufacturer of these transistors and gathering data about the risks of potentially flying with the spacecraft as is. It's really not an easy decision, as replacing some or the entirety of the transistors would likely involve a lengthy delay process. This delay would also mean more costs to be incurred for the mission, as it would need to be reworked and thus stay on the ground for longer. The mission's cost is already well over $4 billion, which is not a small amount. It's essentially NASA's next flagship science mission, and the most expensive one since the James Webb Space Telescope. It would also need a different launch window with different orbital mechanics requirements, and that'll also take more time and more money if it were to happen. Not only that, but this news also comes at a time when many of NASA's science programs are being delayed or, worse, canceled due to budget constraints. And we'll actually get to one of those examples later in this episode. So now, the question is, will NASA have to delay the mission and spend money that it probably doesn't have? Or will it risk flying with potentially faulty parts that may not survive Jupiter's radiation environment? It's really a tough decision, but we'll be keeping an eye on what NASA finally decides to do. Just a few weeks ago, we learned that NASA selected SpaceX to develop and build the spacecraft that'll be used to safely deorbit the International Space Station at the end of its life. Now, both NASA and SpaceX have given more details about what the spacecraft will be like, and there's some really interesting stuff to talk about. First off, look at this render that SpaceX posted on social media showing what the spacecraft might look like. Right away, you can see it's heavily based on the Dragon 2 cargo spacecraft. It has a typical Dragon capsule design, but with a really long and beefed up trunk that has fixed and deployable solar panels with lots and lots of Draco thrusters on the back. SpaceX's Sarah Walker explained this at the recent press conference, noting that they chose this design because it's flight proven and used materials, tooling, and other parts that have already been certified by NASA for the current Dragon. At the end of the day, the more commonality that exists between parts, the more confidence there will be on the new spacecraft even if it's using that newly designed big extended trunk. In fact, the actual Dragon capsule they plan to use will be one that the company plans to take out of the fleet of existing cargo dragons, so it'll literally be flight proven when it launches. Thanks to our own Ryan Caton for catching that, by the way. While it's true that it probably doesn't make sense to put a capsule on a vehicle that's only supposed to be used once and won't return in one piece, on the other hand, being able to use something already built and flight proven kind of makes it more attractive and easier to construct. Not to mention the Dragon capsule will be the part that'll have all the docking systems, the data and communication lines, and all of the rendezvous and docking sensors. Despite that commonality, this is not an easy spacecraft to design and build because it needs to stay docked to the station for about one year before the deorbit happens, and it also needs to operate independently from the station. As the station's orbit decays and becomes abandoned, many components will start failing, which means the spacecraft can't rely on the station's power, propulsion, and guidance, and instead it will need to do all of that on its own. 
It also needs to be resilient against failures because there's no second spacecraft, no replacement to launch, nor a way to even get safely to the station because at those low altitudes, the ISS would lose attitude control. It's precisely because of this that SpaceX chose the beefed up trunk design with multiple types of solar arrays and several Draco thrusters for propulsion and attitude control. Definitely lots of backups everywhere. Walker explained that this modified Dragon spacecraft would have 46 Dracos in total. 16 of them would be ones located in the capsule side of the spacecraft, just like the current Dragon 2 spacecraft, and 30 would be located on the trunk. 22 to 26 of these would then be used at a time to provide the thrust needed for the deorbit burn. By using this many thrusters, the spacecraft would have enough power to perform a precise deorbit to put the ISS in a correct safe re-entry corridor. In order to carry out this burn, the spacecraft's enlarged trunk would also contain about 16 tons of propellant, which is about six times more propellant than the regular Dragon capsule. This would put the whole thing at over 30 tons of mass at liftoff, which means it would need a heavy lift vehicle to put it in orbit. Now, as we mentioned when this contract went out, this contract is just for SpaceX to design and build this spacecraft, but does not include the launch services. This means that, in theory, this spacecraft might be launched by some other rocket that is not a SpaceX rocket. However, Sarah Walker did mention that SpaceX has the intention to bid for this launch using its own Falcon fleet of rockets. So it'll be interesting to see who wins after all. In a shocking turn of events, NASA has canceled Viper, which was going to be the agency's first lunar rover since the Apollo program. Viper, which stands for Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover, was started back in 2019 with the premise of being a precursor robotic mission to the moon before humans returned to the lunar surface under the Artemis program. This rover would have studied the resources on the lunar south pole, specifically identifying potential locations of water ice and making the first direct measurements of it. The rover was originally planned to launch in 2023, but this was delayed to 2024 in order to leave more time for Astrobotic to test its Griffin lander, which was going to be the delivery vehicle for the rover. The rover itself, developed by NASA's Ames Research Center, was already mostly assembled and was undergoing testing prior to launch before the news of the cancellation broke. Due to the last-minute delays with Viper and the additional time needed to test Griffin's propulsion system, the launch was rescheduled to September of 2025, but that's what ultimately led NASA to cancel the project. All of the delays amounted to the mission being over budget above the allotted threshold by law of 30%, which meant NASA had to make a decision on whether to cancel the mission or to ask Congress for more money. Now, if you've watched previous episodes of This Week in Spaceflight, you probably know it's been quite complicated, if not impossible, for NASA to get all of the funding that it needs for its science programs. This means that NASA had to make the tough decision to cancel Viper rather than just hoping to get more money or diverting funds from already existing science projects. This decision has since caused quite a bit of outrage in the space community, leaving many of us perplexed as to why a mission that was so close to being ready to fly is now being canceled. Now what? What's NASA doing with what it does have? Well, the agency plans to disassemble and reuse Viper's components for other missions to the moon in the future. NASA thinks that it could perhaps get similar results with upcoming missions under the Commercial Lunar Payload Services contract. Some of these missions will carry instruments like drillers to also study the lunar ice, and some even have rocket-powered hoppers that will be able to go in and out of the permanently shadowed regions of the moon. The agency also hopes to use the upcoming crewed missions to the moon and the massive potential from the large human landers like SpaceX's Starship and Blue Origin's Blue Moon to conduct a lot more research. So here's hoping that the secondary plan goes much better than Viper. Rocket Lab is getting really close to the first firing of its Archimedes engine. This engine is set to power the company's larger Neutron rocket, with nine of them set to be placed on the first stage, and one vacuum-optimized engine on the upper stage. This oxidizer-rich staged combustion cycle Methalux engine has been in development for about three years now. Rocket Lab started performing component testing between 2022 and 2023, with the company slowly qualifying those parts before finally assembling the first Archimedes engine earlier this year. 
That first engine was then transported and installed onto its test stand at NASA's Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. Since then, Rocket Lab has performed several tests of this engine that did not involve firing it, testing each part in the fully assembled state and at the different stages of operation. This included flowing methane and oxygen through the engine for the first time, as well as testing the ignition system. All of this culminated just last week with a pre-burner test where just that part of the engine is ignited, but not the main combustion chamber. This is all very complex, and Rocket Lab CEO Peter Beck pointed out, quote, These engine cycles are very sensitive to start-up transients and timings, so correct characterization of all the transients and operating points is important to understand. This means that once they have all of that figured out, it'll be the moment to light up the engine fully. Peter mentioned that this could happen within a week of that pre-burner test, so it probably might happen in the next few days, or even the day we publish, because for some reason that does tend to happen a lot. Either way, keep an eye out for the next episode to see if it happened. This week, NASA and Boeing announced that they've completed ground testing of the Starliner Service Module thrusters. Now, if you remember from past episodes, the agency and Boeing had begun a set of hot firing tests on the ground at White Sands to gather data on Starliner's service module thruster behavior. This test would essentially replicate the conditions during flight that were seen for these thrusters on Starliner's way to the ISS, and that way, teams could gather and analyze data from it. This included tests in which thrusters were operated at non-nominal conditions to try and find similar results to what was found on Starliner before it arrived at the station. It also included a test of how the thrusters would subsequently operate after that for undocking and deorbit, gathering additional data on what the behavior of these thrusters might be when it's Starliner's turn to return back to Earth. However, the update does not include anything about said return. Sunita Williams and Butch Wilmore are still on board the ISS, living and working with the crews of Crew-8 and Soyuz MS-25, with no return date in sight. Surely NASA would have at least some idea by now as to when that potential return might happen, but unfortunately, the information is still very scarce on that front. In its latest update, the agency said that it plans to hold a press conference next week to talk about the results of the ground testing, so we have our fingers crossed that we can at least get a better picture by then. But it probably doesn't help that at the last conference, NASA's Steve Stitch already let out the possibility that Sonny and Butch could in theory return from the ISS on SpaceX's Dragon spacecraft. While his remarks sounded like this would just be as a last resort, just this week, NASA awarded SpaceX a contract modification described as a special study for emergency response. Something similar was awarded a few years ago when NASA considered returning astronaut Frank Rubio from the ISS on a Crew Dragon instead of Soyuz in case of an emergency. We pointed this out on social media, and NASA was quick to respond, saying that this contract modification is not related to Starliner and that it's just a contingency option to ensure crew safety aboard the ISS. That said, it's really not great timing to be making these modifications given the current situation. But guess we'll just have to wait and see what NASA says at the press conference next week. And now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. This week, Blue Origin announced that it's completed testing of New Glenn's landing legs in their integrated configuration with the rocket's engine section. The test took place at the company's launch site in Florida, and in fact, we actually spotted the test article and featured it in our latest Space Coast flyover video, but we really didn't know what it was until Blue's announcement. The company's CEO, Dave Limp, mentioned on social media that this hardware is actually flight hardware and not a Pathfinder. That means that this could be the aft section for one of the first boosters to leave Blue's rocket factory in the not-too-distant future. This test is just one of many as Blue Origin prepares for the first flight of New Glenn, hopefully in the coming months. Of course, we are all waiting for the big moment when the components for the first flight start rolling to the launch site and get tested ahead of that launch. With enough luck, we'll get to see that in just a few weeks from now. ESA has kickstarted its Ramses mission, a quick development project to send a robotic probe to Apophis before its close flyby of Earth in 2029. Ramses, which stands for Rapid Apophis Mission for Space Safety, is set to launch in April 2028 in order to make it to Apophis in February 2029. The spacecraft would rendezvous and closely fly next to the asteroid, following it on its Earth flyby expected to take place in April 2029. Since we're less than four years from that launch, ESA had to approve this mission now, which meant taking the budget for this mission from existing resources rather than having to wait for its next budget. This would have been at the November 2025 Ministerial Council when ESA's budget would be set and approved for the following three years. But of course, the agency can't wait that long for that. 
Ramses will therefore join NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission, now renamed as OSIRIS Apex, as another spacecraft that will take advantage of the Apophis close flyby of Earth to study it in detail. It's expected that Apophis may be altered by Earth's gravity as it passes close to our planet, so that'll be quite an interesting object to study. Fresh from the factory, the core stage of NASA's next SLS rocket has finally been rolled out in preparation to fly on the Artemis II mission, the first human spaceflight to the moon since the Apollo program. The stage is now on board the agency's Pegasus transport barge and will be arriving at the Kennedy Space Center probably in the next week or so. Once there, it will be rolled to the transfer aisle within the vehicle assembly building where it will be prepared for stacking and flight. That, however, may take a while as the launch is not expected to take place until at least September of next year. This second core stage, manufactured at NASA's Michoud Assembly Facility in New Orleans, will be the last to roll out in its complete form from this building. Starting with the third core stage, NASA plans to integrate the engine section and tankage at the VAB in Florida rather than integrating it all at Michoud. In fact, the agency already shipped that core stage's engine section to Florida all the way back in 2022. NASA hopes this change will speed up production and integration, as well as lower the costs associated with building these core stages in the future. Percy, Percy, Percy! As NASA's most recent Mars rover, Perseverance seems to be getting all of the attention. But their other Mars rover, Curiosity, is still alive and kicking on the surface of the Red Planet. And in fact, while driving around on Mars, it appears that it may have actually kicked one rock in particular that has scientists stunned. For the last nine months, the rover has been driving around in a location on Mars with rocks rich in sulfur-based minerals. Just a few weeks ago, the rover happened to drive over one of the rocks and it cracked open. When scientists sort of turn the rover around to study the rock, it turns out it wasn't sulfur-based, rather just plain and elementary sulfur. Not a compound or a mixture, just sulfur. This is a pretty puzzling discovery as there aren't many conditions in which pure sulfur occurs naturally, and not only that, this wasn't the only rock made out of pure sulfur. The team discovered a whole field of them around Curiosity. So yeah, turns out that there's still a whole stinking lot more to be discovered on Mars with Curiosity. Now let's take a look at all of the space traffic this week, and well, to no one's surprise, with Falcon 9 grounded, it's been a quiet week for launches. In fact, the only launch we've had was this morning of a Changzhong 4B rocket from China. Liftoff took place on July 19th at 3.03 UTC from Launch Complex 9 at the Taiyan Satellite Launch Center, carrying the fifth Gaofen 11 satellite into sun-synchronous orbit. The satellite will now join the current constellation of Gaofen Earth observation satellites, with this one in particular expected to operate in the optical spectrum. And if all goes well, that won't be the only launch of the week. As mentioned at the beginning of the episode, Falcon 9 is hopefully returning to flight this weekend. If you watched our last episode of This Week in Space Flight, you might remember that the rocket suffered a failure on the Starlink Group 93 mission while attempting to relight the upper stage engine. The 20 Starlink satellites that were flying on board were deployed, but at a lower altitude than planned, and atmospheric drag eventually pulled them out of orbit, so they have been lost. We also mentioned that this failure triggered an FAA mishap investigation, something that a lot of you might be familiar with because of Starship. But just like with Starship, SpaceX had the option of requesting from the FAA a public safety determination. Now this is done when the operator thinks that even though there was a failure, public safety was not compromised at any moment in time. If the FAA agrees, then the operator can return to flight without needing to complete the mishap investigation. Well, DOS went in-depth into all of this on our most recent video, so be sure to check that out if you want to know more. Well, as one would expect, SpaceX asked the FAA for a public safety determination earlier this week, and as of recording, they haven't received FAA agreement yet, but they could receive it really soon. With the agreement in place, and barring any other surprises, Falcon 9 can therefore return to flight right away. SpaceX is wasting no time planning for this return to flight, and it's going to happen with a Starlink launch, of course, from Florida. The recovery fleet has already departed Port Canaveral, and the company seems to be targeting launch no earlier than this weekend on July 21st. The launch will take place from Space Launch Complex 40, with the four-hour launch window opening at 4.59 UTC. If all goes well with Falcon 9's return to flight, SpaceX is planning a quick succession of up to three Starlink launches right after that. The first of those is set to take place from Launch Complex 39A in Florida during a four-hour launch window that opens on July 22nd at 4.44 UTC. 
Then a few hours later, another Starlink launch is set to take place from Vandenberg within a four-hour launch window that opens at 9.44 UTC. The third Starlink mission after Falcon 9's return to flight is set to take place just three days after from the same launch pad at the Cape. The four-hour launch window is set to open on July 24th around 4 o'clock UTC. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news! I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF, and I'll see you all again next week to recap This Week in Spaceflight.